Hi, this is Stuart Weems and thanks for listening to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand insights, strategies and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about superannuation, probably a topic that doesn't excite most people, but something that is really easy to sort out. And once you know the lay of the land, uh, really transparent to work out which is the best option. The reason I'm talking about superannuation this week is that the Productivity Commission released its draft report into the efficiency of the Australian super system and had some pretty um, worrying findings. Uh, The first thing is that they describe superannuation as a bit of a lottery. You know, if you're with an employer and the employer recommends a good fund, you'll do okay, but then there's lots of funds that underperform their peers. So it's a little bit of a lottery. If you end up in a bad fund, it'll cost you a bit of money. When I say a bit of money, the, the product, Productivity Commission reckons somewhere between $61,000 and $407,000, depending on your age. Remember, these are just averages, right? So if you're a higher income earner, it's going to cost you even more. They were really critical of the fee scales within the super industry. So that is that there's, whilst the industry has grown tremendously, they aren't passing on those economies of scale. And finally, they acknowledge that many Australians have multiple superannuation accounts, which all attract separate fees and erode retirement savings. So really, not good, uh, not good news. So if I was in your shoes, I'd be asking, okay, that's great, Stuart, but what do I do with my super? What are the options? There's literally thousands of different super funds and options out there. How do I know which is the best one to go with? So firstly, there's retail funds, retail super funds. They're the ones that are marketed by MLC, AMP, ANZ, which is one path, and businesses like that. So really are marketed by for-profit businesses. Uh, the Productivity Commission said that these were really expensive and typically really poor performance. So it's not a good option. If you're in a retail super fund, um, probably your best option is to switch your super somewhere else. Now, don't just go and do that without necessarily looking at the detail and advice and so forth, because you could have things like insurance linked to your account. There could be high exit fees and these sorts of things. So you really need to look into it, but you really need to find a way and how to get out of that retail fund uh, while still preserving some of those benefits or replicating the benefits in the, the new fund. So if you're with a... Um, a fund own or, or or run by a bank or insurance company, chances are you've, there, there are much, much better options. The next option that people consider are self-managed super funds, and I believe that self-managed super funds are often over-recommended by accountants and financial advisors. That is, that these advisors or accountants recommend that clients set up a self-managed super fund, but they probably don't really need it. It's too much complexity and they don't really get a lot of value from it. So a good um, example of this is quite often I see uh, people with self-managed super funds and they have a lot of money in cash. And that suggests to me, so, so really underinvested, and that suggests to me that they've set up a self-managed super fund off the back of some advice, but without really a strategy in mind. That is, why self-managed super and how am I going to utilize it? My view is that unless you have a significant wealth, some really particular estate planning issues, or a lot of other sort of complexity, the only reason you'd set up a self-managed super fund is if you wanted to invest in direct property. If you don't want to invest in direct property, and typically I like to invest in direct property outside super and, and then have shares and bonds inside super for a bit of diversification, but if you don't want to invest in direct property, then chances are a self-managed super fund's not the right option for you. So if you're getting pressure going down that track to make sure you get some uh, good independent advice of whether it's worthwhile, if you have a self-managed super fund and you've got a lot invested in cash, well, then you really need to get some advice and make sure that you invest that money wisely and get it really working hard for you. The third option is industry super funds, and quite often you'll see them advertised on TV that they're not-for-profit and they're built for members and these sorts of things. Um, Excuse the pun, but I'd like to describe them really as not-for-productivity rather than not-for-profit. So um, I guess the concern is that the absence of a profit motive um, is worthless if there's not a focus on productivity. You know, so it's great they're not looking to make a, a, a profit, but if there's no focus on productivity, that doesn't help either because the the leakage, I guess the financial leakage that otherwise would have gone to a profit goes in a lack of productivity. 
And so there's a, there's a few indicators that I can share with you as someone that operates and has operated in the financial services industry for the last 20 years. Uh, firstly, it's common knowledge that um, roles in within industry super funds typically pay a higher salary than a, a, an identical role, role outside industry super. And in fact, a, a, um, a recruitment consultant that I, I uh, spoke with this week uh, on another matter actually shared with me that one of his clients, an industry super fund, um, offers a 20% higher salary than the market rate. Um, so that that's a concern. There might be a strategy associated with that, but when I share the next bit of information with you, I, I think it starts to build a bit of a picture. So the, the other thing is that the headcount in these businesses is extraordinary. So they're employing more and more people. And it's not surprising given the industry super fund heavily influenced by the unions. So um, there's one industry fund that manages $44 billion worth of uh, super and employs about 330 people. Another industry fund manages $65 billion, so just a little bit more than the first one, and they employ 750 people, which is ridiculous because it's only a little bit more money or extra money, um, but almost twice the head count or more than twice the head count, which is, which is crazy. By comparison, to manage $65 billion, uh, Vanguard, which is the, the world's largest uh, low-cost index fund provider, and they are also not-for-profit, uh, would employ 25 people. So Vanguard, 25 people, an industry fund, 750. So, of course, you can't make that direct comparison because Vanguard does have those economies of scale. So I'm not suggesting that that $65 billion fund can get away with employing even close to 25 people, but they probably don't need 750. And guess who's paying for that? That is the superannuation investor. So typically how we like to invest our clients' monies is to use a wrap platform, which is really just a uh, an account that gives you the sort of flexibility that a self-managed super fund would provide, uh, but without all the hassle and so forth. The, the benefit of this structure is it's very, very transparent. So firstly, we can invest in low-cost index funds, and therefore we've got complete transparency in what each individual fund manager is charging us, how they're investing, and what their performance looks like. Also, then um, clients will be able to see a separate fee paid to the, the RAP platform provider, an administration fee. So again, they can make a, an assessment, what value are they getting as a result of that fee, and is it worthwhile? And finally, as a fee-for-service financial planner myself, I will charge a fee, and that is very transparent as well. So with transparency, um, there's there's just no room to hide, and that's what you really want is more accountability, no room to hide. So that, that obviously works really well for our clients, I think, as I said, because of the transparency and accountability factor works very well. And, and because we're investing in a, a low-cost index passive funds, uh, the, the overwhelming body of research says that our returns will be uh, far better in the long run. Let me mention maybe a holy grail solution, really, one that was mooted by um, Peter Costello a, a few years back, and, and that is that the Australian government should establish a, a super fund and um, and that be the default fund for all Australians. So you still have choice, but if you don't elect to make the choice, you go into this government fund. The reason why I think this is a really good idea or certainly an idea that, that has merit that, that warrants further investigation is that the government has runs on the board. So that is that the future fund, which was 10 years old last year, um, has done pretty well uh, considering or compared to its peers. So its return has been 7.8% compounding since um, 2007 or 2006, six seven when it was started, uh, obviously just before the GFC, so a pretty tumultuous sort of period or, or, or bad timing really in terms of starting a fund at that point in time. Um, by comparison, it compares favourably with the Australia's largest industry super fund for their balanced option over the same period. They did 5.56% in terms of return. So more than 2% higher return, um, uh, which is considerable over the same period of time. So the, the government obviously has runs on the board in that being able to manage a large sum of money. And I think that would give the much needed competition to ensure the industry super funds start getting these economy of scale benefits and start really focusing on productivity. So I hope that uh, podcast has been really useful. Of course, like always, there's links in the show notes and so forth. Until next time, bye for now.